Welcome back to Be The Good With Kate, the show that inspires each of us to see how we have the power to make a difference all around us. Each episode highlights an individual doing good in the world while following their passions, good for their own souls and for others. I get so excited about sharing each and every episode of Be The Good With You, and I hope you enjoy these people and stories. If you're new here, welcome. And if you are returning, thank you so much for your support. I'm so glad you found Be The Good With Kate and would love to hear from you. If you're finding value in these episodes, I invite you to share with someone who could also use this dose of good news or tag me on social with your favorite quote from the episode. Every share, subscriber, review, and comment helps me to share these guests' wonderful work to more people. Thank you for your help in this. Now onto this week's episode. Let's spread a little more goodness in the world. Today on Be the Good with Kate, we have Micah Kessel, who is the founder of Empathable, an award-winning organization that creates science-based immersive experiences that improve empathy across corporate America. He's given dozens of keynotes across the country and was recently booked as a TED speaker in New York, as well as a panel guest at the Boston Museum of Science. In another interview I listened to from Micah, he was described as designing experiences for human flourishing. And I just loved that spin on what he does. So Micah, I'm so looking forward to hearing more. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks so much, Kate. You described me better than I described myself. So <laughs> thank you for that warm intro. Oh, well, you're most welcome. But now I would love it if you filled us in on the rest. So who are you and what do you do in your own words? Yeah, so I think designing experiences for human flourishing is um, a field that I don't think I've coined, but I do think that we have, um, we could use more people on the team <laughs> in the world of people who are designing experiences for human flourishing. I think there are many people who are doing it. More and more people can call themselves people who are doing it. Um, you know, I come from a background originally of, of opera singing. So I started that at a very early age and I was, you know, performing at places like the Metropolitan Opera and um, Carnegie Hall and things like that as a child. And so I got to see these big immersive spaces and notice how these emotional conversations in these big immersive spaces is known as operas, right? Where we're actually very influential towards thinking about, you know, our values and our choices and human behavior. And I think that seeped in at a very early age because I became obsessed with the idea that experiences um, and experiential design can impact the way that, that we um, become socially intelligent and emotionally intelligent. And so I'm really dedicated to creating those spaces for emotional nuance. And since we are in 2023, um, I, I thought, why, what better time to, um, you know, be considering how to do that on a, on a global scalable uh, level. Amazing. Now I have to ask, how did you go from, you know, you're a child, maybe you're a teenager, and you had this idea that there was something more you could do with this idea of the experiential and the empathy and all of that, or did it come a little bit later and it was just kind of in its infancy then? Yeah, so I grew up in, that's a really thoughtful question. Thank you, Kate. Um, I grew up in a few different places, in a very homogenous um, white Anglo-Saxon Connecticut, um, and then also in like a very multicultural, diverse Queens, New York. Um, later, I lived in, in Hamburg, in Germany, um, as an exchange student um, with a German family uh, that I'm still very close to and is still family. Um, and, you know, lived in the Netherlands and Belgium for about 13 years, um, in California for about five years. So I've always been going to these different environments um, from a very early age. And I think uh, coming from different cultures and being in different environments meant that uh, I had to continually adapt. Um, and the interesting thing about adaptation is you're always adapting to the idea that you're always adapting to a group of people who think that their way of doing things is the norm, if you know what I mean. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, you know, especially in, in you know, European countries where you have thousands of years of culture to kind of justify the idea that the way that we do things is the norm. Um, yeah, you're adapt adapting to that idea of a norm. But, you know, in the back of your mind, you know, even if you're saying, yes, that makes sense. Like this way of doing it makes sense. Yes, this is the way it is because this is the way it is. Yes, this is how we do things. You know, somewhere in the back of your mind, you also can tell yourself, well, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. And like, there are other ways to do things. So I think that was always there, right? This idea of other possibilities of, of the way that we see reality. 
So it sounds like you're very much a, a curious, you've always been a curious person and a questioner. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that I, you know, there was never uh, this idea that one way was the given way um, by nature of the way that I was raised. And so um, the idea that, that, you know, you could reinvent reality over and over again um, was in a way very appealing. I think, it, you know, as a creative, but also as a designer and also as a, um, I mean, designers are creatives too, but, you know, as, as someone who arranged ideas as opposed to created them from scratch. Um, and as a business person, really, you know, you're also inventing often from, from nothing. So all of that led to uh, adaptation, improvisation, yeah, things like that. Um, you know, and to be vulnerable, I think, like my parents got divorced when I was seven, which is not, you know, an atypical story in our times at all. But generally speaking, you know, for so many, divorce is about people that don't exactly see, hear, and understand each other, right, in the way that that maybe they could have later in life, or maybe they were never meant to. Um, but in any event, that kind of early childhood desire to live in a space where we could see, hear, and understand each other better was always a part of my life. Um, and so so creating an experience around inclusion and belonging and, you know, empathy uh, probably comes from that as well. Well, and all these uh, quality skills, adjectives, et cetera, that you're describing, it's like we could never have progress without them. So it's just such a great example on that grand scale as well. If we don't adapt, we will completely collapse as a society and a human being. <laughs> yeah, yeah, adaptation maybe like fundamentally is just about realizing that your reality is not the only, re you know, like it's not the way, it's just a way. And, and you know, seeing and, and understanding each other's realities as best we can is, is such a important part of, of the evolution of our of our society and just, you know, getting along and, and hopefully depolarizing our country over time. So I couldn't agree with you more, yeah. Absolutely. So now, how did all of this set the foundation to then create Empathable? So Empathable was created um, first as an immersive physical experience where you could walk in the shoes of other people um, by going into a giant, giant shoe, literally. It was, you know, over 10 feet tall and it was over five feet wide and 12 feet long. And you walked inside and you could see what it's like to, you know, put on the clothing of a very specific individual. And sometimes that individual was a non-binary person or um, a black woman from a first generation college student from a low-income background, or, um, you know, it could be, it could have been anyone. We, we created the experience around a few specific individuals. And as you put on the items of clothing, you kind of transform, you put, you put on their items and you'd be wearing something that you'd not normally wear, which is an interesting feeling to put on an item of clothing that, you know, isn't yours and, and to imagine that it would be yours. Um, and then from there, you'd be, you know, be looking in the mirror, but the mirror would then disappear because it was um, a two-way mirror. And behind that two-way mirror was a screen that would bring you into these point of view, immersive reenactments of real moments in real people's lives. And we brought people through this experience with heart, sweat and temperature monitors together with our emotions research lab at Northeastern. And we noticed that it was more like they were watching a football game than going through a bias training, right? There was something really evocative in terms of how people were experiencing this. And when, you know, when you think about LinkedIn learning and, you know, kind of like the floating head telling you what to do and think, or when you think about sexual harassment trainings that you had to go through at work, they're all so flat in so many ways. And they, they give you concepts, but they don't, give you experiences. And that's ironic because most of what we learn in life, we learn through experiences. So why are we continuing to teach through concepts? And I think realizing that made us realize that we were onto something important. Um, and when you're onto something important, it kind of gets its own legs. So we, we gained a lot of traction by sharing this experience with different hospitals and businesses and universities. And that kind of led to a major um, donation um, and support from one of the country's top app developers, Willow Tree Apps. And so they've uh, given us over $3 million of their time to um, create an iOS and Android app where you're gonna be able to walk in the shoes of different people every day for just five minutes a day or three minutes a day. And But by doing so, um, you know, how much empathy can you 
how much can your life change by having that little moment of adaptation that we were talking about, right? That little moment above, of being able to see someone else's perspective. And so that's kind of how the experience became, got a life of its own. And I feel like I'm a, I'm in service to that life. That is so fascinating. And, you know, I, I recalled as you we were talking about it, I've been a performer since like, I was eight years old in community theater. And that idea of a lot of actors talk about it's when they put the costume on that they really feel in the role, you know, more than anything. And so I just really thought of that when you say, cause that was just such a small version of what you're doing. And I always have felt like when you put the outfit on of the, you know, 1920s rich fill in the blank or the 1960s, blah, 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 it, whatever it is, it really does add to that experience. So I can only imagine what this was like for people to literally step inside this whole world and then this two-way mirror you had as well how how did you actually come up with the concept of creating the structure and getting people there so previous to empathable i was co-founder and creative director of an uh, immersive experience design company in the netherlands uh, our name was Sherlocked. We, we're still there if you go to amsterdam you can still book an experience with sherlocked.nl um, and we had the world's top escape rooms, according to TripAdvisor. Um, and the, you know, the, these escape rooms weren't scary. They weren't zombies. It was more about magic. It was more about immersing yourselves into, you know, an adventure, um, and, uh, uncovering secrets and kind of being in the cinematic magic, uh, that, that life can offer and, you know, asking ourselves in a, in a world where, so much of our time is spent going to dinners and and going to the movies and doing things that we are used to doing. How can we offer something that's like wildly different? Um, so I I watched I don't know thousands and thousands of people uh, over and over again go into these immersive experiences um, in the old stock exchange building of Amsterdam, and it's the same experience, but it's like a different six people every time. And you get to see how like six people can act very, very differently based on the same experience, right? Some people would, and the extremes were there, right? Like people would work collaboratively really well together. People would work completely independently and work well together or completely independently and work awfully together. People would get really frustrated and punch things. Mm -hmm. People would in propose to each other, <laughs> like literally. Um, we had like three marriage proposals. And so we, you know, we could see this huge span of human behavior. And it's exactly, I think what you're saying, Kate, it's when we put on the costumes either literally as you're speaking or metaphorically and get to go into this fantasy world, we get to uncover all of the things that are, are right there underneath the surface in a similar way to that we get to do in dreams. Um, and that self-discovery is obviously fascinating because we love thinking about our own lives and ourselves. Generally speaking, we spend so much time doing so. Um, but to get to do so with other people that are also in that same process is is the stuff that I think, you know, beautiful lives are made of. So um, I was always fascinated in it, but I was doing it for kind of a game uh, company before. And I realized that games are fun and really important and good. And I really support that. Uh, in terms of a business, I think it's a great business, but I, I I was really interested in this human flourishing side. You know, I think at the same time, my background as a Korean American Jewish background as well, um, you know, second generation on my mother's side, um, the fifth generation of my father's, but, you know, always from this New York Jewish heritage, I think there was a lot of, there was a lot of parts of me that are asking themselves what they mean um, to this day. And I know so many of us have parts of us that we're still trying to understand. It, I think it's weird that we, so few people know, you know, 10 generations back where their family was. But 10 generations is not that long ago. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, what, a century and a half or something? Um, don't quote me on that. But, you know, it's not that long ago. And, and yet, yet, it makes up so much, you know, our great, 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 great grandmother probably has qualities that we have too. And 
and to not be able to connect to that um like consciously knowingly because it's written down is sort of sad to me so i think you know creating a world where we can find those parts of ourselves in in real time with each other is beautiful it's a little bit rambly but you know it's my true feelings i loved it yeah yeah I love it. It's so interesting. And it's such an out of the box way. Like you said, it's not the talking heads learning, it's experiential. And it's something that is finally coming out more and more. I mean, even from something like an escape room, as opposed to sitting down at dinner, it makes a, for a whole different experience. So I love this. And I love that you're giving us more details. Thank you so much. And now moving forward to the present with Empathable what give us paint the picture of what you're doing right now you've done that ex- the first exhibit and now you're in this whole new i mean your team is huge i couldn't believe it on the on the website yeah so we share this facilitated we share this experience with organizations um everything from like fortune 500 companies to you know really small community colleges and nonprofits um and everything in between uh, usually speaking with the chief diversity officer, but also speaking with learning and development. This experience is not only about seeing things through the lenses of different races and genders and sexual orientations, body types, ability, and all pieces of identity. It's also about understanding that we're in a time where you know, so many people leave their jobs because of their relationship with their direct manager or lack thereof. There's that old adage, people don't quit their jobs, they quit their leaders. Um, So many leaders have been hired up because they're competent in the skill sets conceptually, but they don't have the ability to create a sense of belonging or to work flexibly in this hybrid time that we're in, or we're all having different needs to create belonging in this environment is very, very complicated. Um, So, you know, going online to learn more concepts about how to belong is is counterintuitive. Um, Going online to walk in the shoes of different perspectives, again, not only in terms of race, gender, and sexual orientation and so forth, but also in terms of how to, you know, how did this one leader that everybody loves working with, how do they deal with feedback? How do they deal with one-on-ones? How do they uh, work through reactive situations in the workplace. Those are valuable questions that I could tell you the answers to those questions in bullet points, but it wouldn't be helpful. You'd hear them, but you wouldn't be able to repeat them in your own behavior. I could show you the point of view immersive experiences of these leaders going through moments of feedback and going through moments of one-on-ones, and you'd be able to adapt them. You'd be able to see them and think, oh, wow, this reminds me of a moment that I have. And by making those connections, we make it more possible for us to integrate the learning. And so, yeah, we've shared this as a facilitated experience with, you know, over uh, 15,000 people at over 100 organizations by now. Um, And, you know, somewhere in the middle of this year, we're going to be launching the app, which is going to allow larger organizations or smaller ones for everyone to go through these types of learning experiences, these leadership management team learning experiences, three or four minutes a day, right? one immersive scene per day on your phone, whenever is good for you. You could watch it in the morning. You could watch it at the gym. It doesn't matter because you can do it on your own, but you're getting this experiential moment. You're getting this point of view, immersive learning moment, and you have time to process it the way that you need to process it. So instead of you know, going to these two hour training sessions where everybody's sitting together and you learn what you learn, you don't learn what you don't learn and you forget it all in two weeks. It's more like a multivitamin and it's more like a supplement. You're getting a little bit every day because that's how we create habit formation. That's how we make real changes and build belong as teams. Wow. This is, this is so fantastic. Now tell me Micah about some of the good news moments, I like to call them, that you've seen, you know, some of the stories of companies or individuals that have come back to you after working with you. So we were in a time, you know, no one would disagree, I think. Um, We're in a time of intense polarization. And Mm -hmm. what that means is that we really don't know, you know, really how to see and hear each other as well as as we could, of course. Um, I can remember an experience that we shared 
about how um, people don't move out of the way on the sidewalk for certain other people of different races. And, you know, if you look at that as a concept, then you, you can debate that to the end of time. You could go on Reddit or Twitter and you can look at all of the comments and you can form an opinion and you can take a side. Great, but not very helpful to our world, in my opinion. Um, instead, this person at a small municipality um, somewhere in Texas watched this experience and said, you know, I think that was rude. I don't get it. We all, we all have a fair chance. I, I don't, I don't, I think I move out of the way for people. I don't understand. And we said, thank you so much for sharing that experience. We really appreciate it. Right. So we didn't debate this person. We didn't fight this person. We didn't tell them this is what we think. And this is why you're wrong. We didn't do any of that. We just said, thank you for sharing the validity of your experience, realizing that this person was going to process in their own time. And one week later, we came back to that person and we checked in and we said, how, how have you been processing? And this person said, you know, I've been thinking about it and I still think it was rude, but I noticed that I've been walking down the street differently since seeing the experience. I noticed I've been moving down the street differently. And I think that that is a, a story of what change really looks like. Change isn't, you know, you telling me what I'm doing wrong, Kate, and then me saying, Kate, you know what? In the last 10 seconds, I've completely changed my perspective <laughs> and you've, I see the light now and you've turned this light bulb on and I get it and I'm going to change forever. Change is probably, you tell me what you think and I'm a little bit defensive and I say thanks, but I kind of, you know, I'm upset with you about it. And then, you know, weeks go by and I see myself doing that thing. And I think, oh, wow, did I just do that thing? And that's, that's the best case scenario. That's, that's a good, that's a good scenario, but also quite likely, you know, nothing happens. Apathy or pushback or defensiveness happens. And so that was a great example of how experiential learning changes behavior. And I've seen that type of thing, that type of moment where we didn't push back and someone learned in their own time. I can't tell you how many times, dozens, if not hundreds of times in sharing point of view, immersive learning experiences at Empathable. Wow. Uh, and it, it does, it makes so much sense when you start to think about just how we do process things and how we take criticism or suggestions or anything in between. Have there been mantras or sayings that you keep coming back to or you share with your team a lot over the years? Yeah. One that really stands out to me is um, centered around the way that we are defining empathy in the dictionary and often how people define empathy with each other, um, which is uh, understanding how someone else feels. And something that I continually remind myself of and others is that we don't, and we never will. Scientifically, we never will because our, our brain never leaves our body. And we we are making a model of our senses, which are, you know, predicting what's happening in the world. We don't, we don't actually, we don't actually know. And we can't really ever truly walk in anyone else's shoes. Not truly. Um, so the, the saying or the motto that I believe is really central to my work, um, but also really helpful for others in, in the world that we, we share with is that empathy is really about the celebration of the validity of each other's experiences to be as valid as our own. And maybe I don't have to understand to celebrate it as valid. And maybe actually it's asking too much to, to, to like need to understand. Maybe not even from me, but maybe from you. Let's say that just, just like yesterday, a colleague of mine was telling, me about a workplace bullying moment where a colleague of hers was bullying her in the workplace and he didn't mean to be, it was clear that he didn't know that he was doing it and it wasn't intentional as you know, most social mistakes at work are not intentional, I would say, but nonetheless, it felt like bullying. And she said to me, I said, are you gonna talk to him about it? 
Um, not saying that she should, because far be it from me to be able to give her advice. You know, it's it's her call. But I said, are you going to talk to him about it? And she said, you know, I just, I can't. I just, I don't have the energy. I don't want to put in the time to try and explain my perspective to this person and try and get him to understand like I have too much to do and there are too many colleagues that I have and I and she's right like why should she have to do the work in my opinion she's right why should she have to do the work to teach a colleague that made a social mistake when he's the one that made a social mistake instead what would be so much better is if he could realize that he made the social mistake without needing to understand, you know, all the reasons behind why she felt that it was bullying. And instead could say, I hear that you felt that it was bullying. And without knowing all of the reasons in your life why that is the case, I am celebrating that that is a valid experience and just as valid as my experience. And on blind faith, I am, I am seeing that as just as valid as mine. So I'm going to celebrate that and know that, that, you know, without you needing to explain it, I am going to change. And if we ever come to a point in our relationship where, you know, you want to talk with me about it, that's great. But if we don't, that's great too. Just know that, you know, I respect how you feel about it. And this is, this is what I'm going to do as a result. Like that's, I think the world that we need to be living in because we don't, we, we can't expect people to explain themselves constantly and justify themselves constantly anymore. We have too many connections and too many interactions. Work is too complicated. We have ancestral traumas and generations of complexities that we are unpacking ourselves in therapy and with our friends. <laughs> like, do we really expect to live in a world where it's so I know I'm rambling again, Kate, but I just I think this is such an important one for me. And it just this weekend it really hit home while talking to my friend. We need to stop trying to understand each other. And we need to start celebrating the validity of each other's experiences instead. So is that kind of the crux of what you are working for each day of just getting people to have more empathy to then go about their lives and stopping those interactions before they happen because they are realizing, oh, this could come across as bullying or as an insult or as something and or is, is that right? Is that a good way to kind of summarize it or you want to put it in different words? Yeah, no, I would say that's a great way to summarize it. The most biologically, you know, based on our work at, at Harvard Northeastern, um, so this is a, a bias research lab and an emotions research lab that I, I, design, I, I work with and I, I think about design with. And I know from, from these labs works that the two most expensive things that the human brain can be doing are moving like physical activity very biologically expensive we burn a lot of energy moving and we burn a lot of energy learning learning is very biologically expensive it's very costly so i'm saying that in a world that has taught us that we need to understand something in order to learn and change i'm questioning that i'm saying maybe we don't maybe we no longer need to understand why someone's having the perspective that they're having in order to honor it and in order to give space for it because they're going to change anyway and we're going to change anyway and they're not a static person and I'm not a static person so let's instead take the time to just hold space for the realities that we're living in in this moment and trust and have faith that if we do so we're going to have less conflict we're going to argue about things that aren't important less you know like most fights how what percentage of people's arguments two days later do they look back and think oh we probably didn't need to have that fight oh, so like why are we fighting so much about things that are going to change anyway that is such an interesting way to to frame it and and explain this idea because it's hard we do we do have this craving, I think, a lot of times if I want to understand everything about a person. And sometimes it's, we're just not going to understand, but we can respect them and mm -hmm. we can go about it with empathy. This is this is such fantastic work you're doing. Micah, I, a question I've been asking all my guests lately is if someone came to you and they said, I want to make a difference because they see that you are obviously doing so much good in the world with what you're doing. So I want to make a difference, but I don't know how to start or where to start? Is there any advice you'd give that person? 
Yeah, I teach a lecture at the University of Virginia um, that I've been doing for a few years. And this is an exercise that is great for undergrads, but frankly, it's great for everyone, including people who are already in the professional world. Okay, you might want to write this one down if you're, or take a note on your note app or listen to it later. So it's three steps. Um, it's not that complicated to, to think about, but it's, it'll take a little bit of work, but it's worth it. I think it's worth it. Step one, write down every single choice you've ever made in your entire life. <laughs> now that might okay, sound... we'll check back in a year. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, ex exactly. It depends on how you look at it, right? So if you yeah, look at sure. it as, you know, did I choose to um, paper or plastic, like strawberry or vanilla last week, then yes, you will be here an entire year and you still won't have every choice written down. If you just intuitively ask yourself based on the reality of your own fictional existence, right? What are the choices that matter to me? Those are the, like, just from a gut feeling, these are the choices that I think are the choices I really made from the earliest age you can think about till now. So write down every single choice. On average, I notice people write down something like 30 choices um, if they're already in their twenties or older. Okay, that's step one. Step two, write down underneath those choices, why did you make that choice? Like, what what was the reason behind that choice? Um, and you might need to do that in day two, you know? So do in day one, write down every choice you made day two, write down why did you make that choice? And then on the third day or in the third session, write down the value that that why was based on. What value was it based on? And values, you know, Mark Manson who wrote, what's that book called? The Subtle Art of Not Giving Up, um, oh, right? Yeah. He, yeah, really popular book. He defines values really nicely. Values are immediately under your control. Sorry, they're under your control. You decide, you know, you can decide them. Um, you can enact them immediately. Um, and they're generally good for the world. So for example, being honest, under your control, basically, generally good for the world, basically. And you can do it like immediately if you wanted to. Being the most popular person in the room, not under your control, probably not better for the world if you're the most popular person in the room, and certainly not something you can do immediately, right? So not doesn't count as a value, or you could say it's a bad value, but good values have those three qualities. So write down all of the values behind that why, right? I, I decided to sing opera when I was 10 years old. I did it because I was looking for spaces for, you know, an outlet for my creativity um, in a time where I didn't have it. The value was that I wanted to have um, a way to express emotional nuance. I felt like sharing emotions is important to me. There we go. That's a value. I can do it whenever I want. It's generally good for the world um, under my control. So all of those whys, write down all of those values. And then go to take a nap because you did tons of good work and you you're doing a great job and then later the next day or whatever go back and tally it up and see which value in your lifetime has been the one that you have exercised the most what is the value the good value ideally that you based and if, if you made a choice based on a bad value just ask yourself what what value do i wish i would have applied that's the workaround there okay which value did you apply the most the one with the most tallies that must be one of your deepest values by definition by definition it's one of your deepest values so how can you apply that value into your life how can that be a centering grounded element of everything else you do because if you know one of your deepest values then you could be working in job a or b or c you could be doing profession d or e or f chances are you're going to be able to apply that value no matter where you are and it means that you don't have to make a 180 degree change in what you're doing. You can already contribute to yourself and to the world from where you stand or sit at this moment. I loved that. I love a good tangible exercise. <laughs> it's right up my alley. I can't wait to put that into practice. And um, I hope that any listeners who are willing to share, I would love to hear about what you come up with there. That was definitely the most, you know, the... I'd say the themes were of that similar of finding, you know, from inside yourself, what you want to give into the world, but to put it in that, again, using that word of framework was so unique and so interesting and so tangible. 
I loved that. Micah, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Oh, thank you, Kate. It was really a pleasure being here. It's great sharing time with you. Um, yeah, and I look forward to hearing what your deepest value is too. Oh, thanks. And please tell everybody where we can find you and Empathable online. Yeah, so absolutely. You can find Empathable at empathable.com. So E-M-P-A-T-H-A-B-L-E, empathable, empathable.com. Um, and then, you know, scroll all the way to the bottom at the footer, put your email in, and we'll make sure to send you really interesting blogs um, and information about how you can build more empathy into your organization, into your life, into your connections, how you can be creating radical change without changing the radicals. All these social science tools that we have gained from our scientific work will find ways to give that to you in a really applicable, easy way that you can apply into your life. So definitely sign up at empathable.com. Wonderful. And I feel like fascinating has been my word of the day here in this interview. It just keeps coming out of my mouth because this is also fascinating. Thank you so much, Micah. Oh, thank you, Kate. It was great meeting you. Talk to you next time. Hey there, listeners. A reminder, last week we started giving those shout outs to the Good Deeds doers who were nominated during my birthday week. And something I loved are the people that gave shout outs to their husbands or wives. So here's one of them. Miriam from Patrick. Dr. Miriam Lawfer is a pediatric infectious disease specialist with a primary research interest in malaria and global child health. She has conducted research, clinical care, and professional education in resource-limited countries in Africa and Asia and has dedicated nearly two decades to working in Malawi. She has done so much and she is still going nonstop. She's a loving mother as well, living in the Baltimore, Maryland area. You can find her online at Miriam Lawfer, L-A-U-F-E-R, if you look up Dr. Miriam Lawfer and on Twitter. Thanks for the shout out. More to come next week. Thanks so much for listening to Be the Good with Kate Cherichello. Whether you're listening on YouTube or via podcast, it would mean the world if you liked, subscribed, and or left a review. You heard about the good? Now go out and be the good in your life this week. If you have stories of good news that need to be shared, please send me a message. Thanks again and have a great week.